I'm Shelley Kagan. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Yale, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Phil Kitcher, whom uh, we've just been discussing how long it is that uh, uh, we've known each other. Uh, it goes back at least 20 years, uh, and uh, at the time I was considering uh, uh, going to UCSD, where the Kitchers were at the time, uh, and instead I ended up here. It's taken 20 years, but it's of course a great pleasure to, fact, to, to have uh, Kitcher finally here at Yale. Um, in, when Dale Martin introduced him yesterday, he, he rattled through some of the biography, so I won't do that today. He also mentions uh, one or two of the honors, but I want to just give you a, a somewhat larger picture of that. Among his honors, uh, Professor Kitcher has won a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has won a Distinguished Teaching Award. He has won a Humboldt Prize. He has won a Lionel Trilling Award. And he's won uh, a Friend of Darwin Award. And I assure you this does not come close to uh, all of them. Uh, yesterday it was mentioned that uh, he's got a dozen plus perhaps books uh, and more articles uh, uh, than, than you would believe, so I looked it up. Now, the, the most recent uh, CV I could find was some three years ago, and it had 146 articles uh, on it. Uh, it occurred to me that if I were to actually try to read to you all of his publications, just the titles of all his publications, it would use up the fully allotted 45 uh, minutes uh, or so uh, for the talk. And that would still leave us with some time for, for him to fill us in on all the articles he's published in the last 10 years, <laughs> uh, last, last uh, three years. Um, one other remark is to say just that people who are coming new to Professor Kitcher's work may not have an adequate sense of uh, the remarkable breadth. Uh, this is somebody who, of course, now works on the issues of uh, secular humanism, uh, religion, uh, previous to that, uh, evolution, creationism, biology. Uh, he started off in philosophy of mathematics. Indeed, uh, two early articles, one was Fluxions, limits, and if I understand this, infinite littleness. Um, uh, another one was Bolzano's ideal of algebraic analysis. Now, I know that many of you came here in hopes that we would learn more about Bolzano's <laughs> ideal of algebraic analysis, but you'll have to, have to look up the article. Um, but even this doesn't give you a full sense uh, of, uh, of the work. Uh, some three or four years ago, uh, he published a book called An Invitation to, uh, rather called uh, Joyce's Kaleidoscope, An Invitation to Finnegan's Wake. Uh, I think this just gives you a sense of the full range uh, of interests, and we're getting uh, more of that in, in this lecture series. Um, uh, actually, one or two items of business I should uh, ask you, if you haven't yet done it, please turn off your uh, uh, telephone so we don't have any interruptions. The, the lecture is being recorded. Uh, at the end of today's lecture, there will be time for questions, and I'll give you some instructions uh, with regard to that when the time comes. Uh, meanwhile, let me uh, please just ask you to uh, welcome Professor Kitcher back for a second time. Today's topic is Ethics as a Human Project. Thank you very much, Shelley. Okay, thank you. That's, that was, a, that was a, a lovely introduction. Fully ethical beings are those able to direct their conduct by judgments about what they think of as good or right or virtuous or valuable. Most of the time, they may act from habit, but they sometimes stop, consider what course of action would be best, and act on the basis of their deliberations. They can subordinate some of their wishes, even their most intense impulses, to the value judgments they accept. They can reflect on those value judgments and discuss them with their fellows. They can ponder potential techniques for giving their considered evaluations more power to govern their actions. So, the fully ethical life requires a complex array of psychological dispositions and capacities. Some elements of it are occasionally visible among non-human animals who act in ways that appear praiseworthy. But the only fully ethical beings we know of are human. Many religious people, as well as many philosophers, think that ethical life is answerable to an external standard, one independent of human decisions. Those who stop to think about what to do may try their best to find the right continuation but ethical success isn't guaranteed, not even if their conclusion 
is thoroughly endorsed by the settled judgment of their society. Religious people often locate this external standard in the transcendent realm. On some philosophical accounts, too, the standard is divorced from the natural world, grounded in a domain of platonic forms or non-natural properties or idealized processes of practical reason. Other philosophers resist this kind of divorce. They hope to explain the standard in natural terms. Sometimes they measure the good by the aggregate of pleasure over pain among all sentient beings. Or, this is a particularly bad proposal, calculate goodness in the fundamental currency of Darwinian evolution, reproductive success. Now, the first challenge that I'm going to consider to my secular humanism consists in maintaining that any satisfactory account of the ethical life must honor an external standard, call it the ethical order of the cosmos, and that it's impossible to do so without recourse to the transcendent. There are two options for replying. One attempts to dispense with any external standard at all. Ethical delib deliberation answers only to local ethical practice. Now that looks disastrous. It gives up any touchstone for assessing the codes of various societies, and as the religious challenger predicted, it seems to lead to Ivan Karamazov and the permissibility of anything. The alternative approach, finding a natural basis for values, suffers from all the objections commentators and critics have lavished on particular suggestions. The would-be identifications fail to pick out the correct classes of actions as good or bad, valuable or worthless. And none can explain the force that ethical judgments have for us. Moreover, if there were some external standard to which innovators were responding at those moments in history when ethical advances seemed to happen, in recognizing the wrongness of slavery, for example, we'd expect whatever natural facts ground value judgments to play some explanatory role in accounting for the change of mind. You can't understand moments of scientific discovery without appreciating the altered relations between discoverers and the aspects of nature they detect. But history seems to offer precious little by way of clue on the natural facts that ethical pioneers detect for the first time. So how should we meet this religious challenge, or more generally, explain the apparent objectivity of ethical life? I think we need a new framework, one that expands the range of options available. I'm going to develop that framework by following a fundamental insight of Darwin's, of whom, as you've just learned, I'm a friend. When we're puzzled about some cluster of phenomena, we can sometimes expand our options by taking a historical perspective and thinking about how the puzzling phenomena have come to be. Full ethical life, as I said at the beginning, requires a complex set of conditions. Tracing their emergence makes it possible to repose questions of ethical objectivity, to escape from a menu of options limited by inadequate concepts. Developing the account will take me a little bit of time, and objections are likely to flood in along the way. I speak from bitter experience here. But I hope that by the time the story is complete, I will have assembled resources for providing answers. So let's begin a long time ago. Human beings evolved from ancestors who had a few of the traits needed for full ethical life. Many primates have genetically encoded neurotransmitters, inclining them to take pleasure in the company of their fellows. Sociality extends deep into the pre-human past. In our more recent history, hominids have spent almost all the time period since our most recent common ancestors with the chimpanzees and bonobos, that's about five million years ago, in social groups of a very particular sort, bands of about 30 to 70 conspecifics, mixed by age and sex. Now, if you think of this room, probably about right, except that there are too few very young people. For all its neural attractions, living together isn't easy. Most primates settle for more sporadic social interactions or severely limit the number of mature males in the group or opt for a smaller troop size. 
Like the chimpanzees and bonobos of today, our hominid ancestors managed a more unusual set of social arrangements. Their achievement rested on a psychological capacity recognizable in our evolutionary cousins and one inspiring some primatologists to credit them with the building blocks of morality. Chimps and bonobos have the ability to identify the intentions of their fellows and based on the recognition to adjust their own plans so as to aid the others in reaching the goals they attribute to them. That capacity, I'll call it responsiveness, promotes cooperative projects and accommodations that reduce social tension. Yet the responsiveness is limited. The ally who helped yesterday proves indifferent today. And the lack of response arouses protest and conflict. Eventually, reconciliation is needed, and the animals have to huddle together, reassuring one another through mutual grooming. The social life of chimpanzees, even that of the more relaxed bonobos, is tense and fragile. Because these animals have a capacity for responsiveness, they can live together as they do. Because that capacity is restricted, they can't live together easily. Time and motion experts would be appalled at the wastefulness of three hours spent in grooming on a normal day and six hours dedicated to similar gestures of reassurance when the social order is threatened. Possibilities for profitable cooperative ventures go unrealized. Group size is bounded by the daily demands for face-to-face -face interaction. Human group size only began to increase in the late Paleolithic, 15 to 20,000 years before the present. Hundreds of thousands of generations of our hominid ancestors spent their lives in the chimp bonobo predicament. How did we escape? Studies of chimpanzees show they can control pressing desires in the presence of an established social practice, as when members of the troop await their turn for access to water. Investigations of social primates and of very young children reveal a similar capacity for self-restraint in pairwise interactions where there's an established pattern of mutual expectations. An obvious hypothesis is that our hominid ancestors further extended an incipient ability for self-control, so their conduct became subject to what I'm going to call normative guidance. From the initial perception of some forms of behavior as generating unwelcome consequences, and from the awareness of expectations about actions in dyadic partnerships, they elaborated the practice of self-restraint across a widening set of circumstances. With the acquisition of language came the ability to represent the types of contexts and problematic actions, to specify patterns for conduct. Those specifications could be made not only by an individual to bind his own behavior, but in discussion with others. Discussion yielded rules for action, patterns for life together, structures for a shared social life, passed on across the generations by methods for transmitting to the young the law of the group. If, as anthropologists suppose, the conditions of hominid social life were akin to those of contemporary hunter-gatherers, socially embedded normative guidance would be worked out among adult members of the groups on terms of rough equality. In challenging environments, no mature individual is dispensable. It would be risky not to allow all voices to be heard and not to seek an outcome all could accept. For tens of thousands of years, our human precursors worked out the codes that would have governed their lives together. They continued a venture initiated at least 50,000 years before the present and probably far older. We are their heirs, and like them, we continue the ethical project. Ethics didn't begin with the responsiveness of our remote primate ancestors, nor with the exertion of self-control directed by the perception of mutual expectations in a pairwise interaction, nor even with the earliest efforts in specifying the patterns of behavior to which group members would be expected to conform. The beginnings were almost certainly crude and simple, directives to share with others and to avoid unprovoked violence. 
Moreover, the most likely basis for the original conformity is fear. Temptation to stray was quelled by the anticipation of punishment to follow. A practice focused on such primitive imperatives in which compliance is the result of fear seems unworthy to count as the start of ethics. But socially embedded normative guidance set the stage for processes of cultural selection in which elements of the codes tried out by different groups competed for transmission across space and time. Besides the winnowing of specific patterns of behavior, selection culled the techniques through which group members were brought to feel the force of the requirements the local code set down. Successful experiments built the human conscience, finding ways to make the commanding voice seem as if it came from within. Human beings have acquired a heterogeneous assemblage of devices for redirecting their intentions, as the basic fear of punishment has been supplemented by respect for the group and its traditions, pride in alignment with the code, and corresponding shame and guilt at lapses from it, solidarity with fellows, and more besides. In the way of evolution generally, redundancy is valuable, allowing a system to be buffered against the failure of some key component. Contrary to the familiar philosophical fiction, there isn't a special ethical point of view reached in attaining some special process of reasoning or some privileged emotion. There is only a hodgepodge of motivational devices, all of them welcome, none of them acquired at the moment when ethics really begins. The elements of ethical life were assembled gradually, and it's foolish to seek some non-arbitrary stage at which human beings, or possibly hominids, crossed a threshold and truly began the ethical project. Skip forward. Among the first written documents to survive, dating from roughly 5,000 years ago, are addenda to bodies of law testifying both to the complex forms of social organization attained in ancient Mesopotamia and to the pre-existence of systems of patterns of behavior assembled over many generations. Cultural evolution must have led from the earliest ethical or proto-ethical practices, probably akin to the practices of contemporary hunter-gatherers, to the codes of the far larger groups who inhabited the first cities approximately 8,000 years ago. The clues from the Paleolithic are too scanty to discriminate among many possible ways in which the evolution of culture might have gone, but I think we can be confident about some of the steps. First, because of the need to increase the supply of scarce resources, cultures adopted a division of labor. Efficiencies in apportioning tasks, as well as an increase in the number of cooperative activities, probably led to the generation of occasional surpluses. That allowed for profitable exchanges with neighboring bands and an expansion of the ethical framework to cover, at least sometimes, people who had hitherto been outside the protections of the ethical code. Domestication of plants and animals probably brought the institution of private property. Finally, the structuring of human life around cooperative interactions, often with the same partner, surely engendered an appreciation of the importance of mutual responsiveness. That was reflected in later ethical codes as a valuable ideal, something to be cherished independently of the ostensible goals of cooperation. So arose the conception of enduring relationships as central to human life and appreciation of a far richer set of possibilities for human existence, something already visible in early Mesopotamian and Egyptian documents. The ethical project has yielded a repertoire of emotions, desires, and ideals quite beyond the imaginings of its early pioneers. Two other aspects of the evolution of the project help in addressing the religious challenge. By the time of the settlement of the first cities, human societies had lost the egalitarian character of the origins. Private control of livestock probably played an important role in generating the later hierarchies of Ur and Babylon. Already in the division of labor and the differentiation of roles, a contrast among rival possibilities for the shape of human lives may have planted the seeds of future inequality. 
Beyond these eroding tendencies, however, egalitarianism was challenged by a second cultural innovation. Ethnographic records testify to the almost universal popularity of a device for increasing compliance with a group's code when its members are outside the view of their fellows. Invoke some instrument of detection, a transcendent policeman, a deity in the sky who observes all and is intent on punishing those who deviate. This idea was probably grafted on to antecedent beliefs about a higher realm. Its advantages are evident, and it was obviously widely borrowed or reinvented. Once the idea was in place, it disrupted the earlier equality in ethical discussion. People who could successfully convince others of their own access to the policeman's will now enjoyed the authority to declare how the prevalent code should be amended. Ethical insight became the province of a discerning few. Okay, a story. One short on many important details, probably mistaken about a lot of others. But suppose something of that general sort is right. Does it allow us to talk of ethical truth and ethical falsehood? or envisage any objective standard according to which divergent ethical judgments might be assessed? When we look back into history, we're inclined to make such assessments. From the late 18th century to the present, uneven and sporadic processes have modified the status of women, affording them greater opportunities. Chattel slavery is no longer viewed as permissible. In my own lifetime, I have seen an enormous sea change in attitudes about same-sex relationships, and that sea change is surely going on visibly at the moment. Reaching further back into history, the ancient prescriptions of Mesopotamian law codes directing that the murder of a child should be avenged by killing the child of the perpetrator gave way, a millennium later, to the more familiar idea of exacting the murderer's own life. Hardly the last word, but surely an improvement on the law it replaced. Examples like these suggest that the history of ethical practice isn't a sequence of mere changes, simply one damn thing after another. Global judgments about progress are problematic. Comparisons of the culture of one society at one time with that of the same or a different society at a different time are probably impossible. Ethical progress may be unsystematic and even rare. Nevertheless, with respect to a sample of episodes in which one pattern for conduct gave way to a different one, talk of progress is hard to resist. People who have lived through the transition oppose the thought that it would be equally justifiable to go back. Is this concept of ethical progress coherent? Apparently, progress requires an external standard of ethical truth. The abolitionists, we may say, recognized a truth that slavery is wrong, at odds with the dominant judgment of their contemporaries. Yet history reveals no moment at which the relations between some pioneer abolitionist and the sources of ethical truth were modified. There's no analog of Röntgen's famous encounter with a fluorescing screen that sparked his discovery of x-rays. Historical analysis can present the circumstances under which some early opponents of slavery first came to question the prevailing attitudes, but it doesn't supply clues about the character of any shift in relations to external sources of truth. Religious people, as well as some philosophers, will see this as the impoverished consequence of secularism. A genealogy of ethics, they will say, inevitably debunks the practice, undermining any attempt to take, and take even our most cherished values seriously. Secular humanists might return the compliment. They might say, when the rhetorical flourishes are scrutinized, religion has nothing better to offer. Its preferred ethical order is as hard to relate to the historical narrative as any naturalistic surrogate. But I think there's a better reply, and that is that to point out that the skeptical argument turns on a highly specific notion of progress. 
Even in the case of the sciences, it's not always clear that progress consists in the replacement of error by true belief. Elsewhere, in technology and in medicine, for example, progress is typically made through overcoming the problematic features of the current situation. Progress in transportation technology often consists in constructing new vehicles to break barriers previously imposed on travel. Progress in medicine is made by developing new techniques for curing, treating, or palliating conditions that were hitherto painful, disabling, or even fatal. New propositional knowledge sometimes serves as a means to progress, but it's not the heart of the matter. Recall my narrative of the early phases of the ethical project. Socially embedded normative guidance provided a way out of a problematic situation, whose symptoms were the recurrent instabilities of social life and whose underlying cause lay in our restricted responsiveness to one another. The deep feature of the human predicament is that evolution has bequeathed to us a disposition to live together, all those nice neurotransmitters, and a limited capacity for the necessary responsiveness to others. We can do it, but we can't naturally do it easily or well. Ethics began by partially overcoming the problems posed by this predicament. It started as a form of social technology. If you view progress as problem solving, the concept of ethical progress proves coherent. All too frequently, our understanding of progress is limited by thinking in terms of proximity towards some fixed goal. So cognitive progress is identified with approximation to the truth. Yet it's absurd to suppose some ideal system of transportation towards which transportation technology strives to find its way, or some ideal state of perfect health that doctors try to help their patients approximate. Better to think in terms of progress from rather than progress to, and make the same switch of perspective in the ethical case as well. If you do this, you abandon a picture that has beguiled religious thinkers as well as many secular philosophers, the vision of a pre-existent ethical order, something we strive to discover and to exemplify in our lives and deeds. There's just the ongoing project, always beset by difficulties, never finished. The general predicament from which the ethical project tries to free us can always emerge in new guises. Yet that's not the only source of new challenges. Technological solutions typically beget further problems. New vehicles require rules and structures for coordinating their movements, systems for enforcing the rules and maintaining the structures. We need roads and stoplights and traffic police and driver education and all the rest of it. A device is introduced to address an existing problem, but the solution depends on particular conditions, posing the new problem of maintaining those conditions. Similarly, the original function of ethics was to overcome the limits of our responsiveness, but the evolution of the ethical project has brought new functions in its train. When the demands imposed on satisfying one function don't interfere with the fulfillment of others, the task of technology is relatively straightforward. Find a device that does everything. In practice, that may prove difficult, but when functions conflict, an additional issue needs to be resolved. Given that addressing one problem requires sacrificing the thoroughness with which others can be overcome, an order of priorities has to be established. Functional conflict makes difficulties for other forms of technology, and it's the root cause of why ethics is so hard. The concept of progress on offer is thus incomplete, because new problems emerge, functional conflict is a possibility, and when it arises, there must be some specification of what compromises among functions constrain progressive change. A primary instance of functional conflict in the ethical case results from an important shift in ethical practice. The original function of ethics, 
overcoming the limits of our responsiveness to others, was initially fulfilled through normative discussions on terms of rough equality. But with the proliferation of possibilities for human lives, the early egalitarianism was compromised. For at least the past seven millennia, the ethical lives of many societies have been torn between answering to the perspectives of all their members and maintaining the conditions that allow a rich menu of human possibilities, typically available only to a small elite. Progress can only be determined in the wake of a decision about the relative priority of such conflicting functions. So a complete concept of ethical progress presupposes some normative stance. I'm going to postpone for a little bit articulating my preferred stance and just assume that the original function of ethics, the problem of responding to our lack of responsiveness, shouldn't be neglected. Specifically, suppose the efforts to increase responsiveness are to be prized, even if there are costs for fulfilling rival functions. That allows us to pick out some progressive transitions in the history of ethical practice. For example, whenever societies began to insist that their members not tell one another things the informants believed to be false, they attempted to forestall episodes in which speakers failed to respond to the recognizable wishes of their audiences. Ethical progress was made through accepting the precept that deception is wrong. Human dependence on others for information and guidance is a permanent feature of our condition. <coughs> As we envisage the further development of ethical practice, commitment to responsiveness would require the prohibition of dishonesty. The precept will continue as a stable part of progressive ethical practice. Following the pragmatists, we can think of truth as what emerges in the indefinite march of progress. Truth happens to an idea, as James says. If you proceed in that way, then you invert the idea of progress as the discovery of prior truth. Truth is what you get as you make progress. So secular humanism can rehabilitate a notion of ethical truth. It can defend a set of core ethical truths, rough generalizations corresponding to the good advice you all learned at your parents' knees. Lying is wrong is true for the most part, as Aristotle might say or in a more modern idiom, is a good default policy. Undermined only when responding truthfully would exemplify an even greater failure of responsiveness. So there's an ethical standard against which the practices of different societies can be assessed, an idea allegedly unavailable once the thought of a pre-existent ethical order is forsworn. Yet if the normative stance used to elaborate the notion of ethical progress allows for different ways of compromising ethical functions to count as progressive, some ethical issues may be permanently irresoluble. Rival traditions that strike the compromise in different, equally allowable ways may progress indefinitely without ever completely converging. Each may regard the other as committed to an attractive, if subordinate, ideal an ideal they'd like to realize subject to fulfilling a function they take to be dominant. Societies emphasizing the importance of a rich set of options for human lives may try to achieve as much responsiveness to all their members as is possible without diminishing the menu of opportunities beyond a particular threshold. Those committed to the egalitarian representation of all voices may attempt to proliferate the human possibilities so long as they don't retreat too far from conditions of full equality. Some ethical questions, for example, that of exactly how to trade conditions of equality against richness of possibilities for living, may lack determinate answers. Does an account of this sort really meet the challenge directed against secular humanism? It's time to respond to some concerns and objections, and that will lead me to develop the account further. A first and obvious worry is that assimilating ethics to social technology won't account for ethical objectivity. Technologies are grounded in subjective preferences directed towards goals particular human beings want to achieve. People seek new forms of transportation, for example, because they'd like to reach currently inaccessible places. 
Talk of problems suggests misleadingly that they're objective conditions, spurs to action quite independent of the agent's wants. That, suggests the critic, is a mistake. To be a problem is to be felt as a problem. But this objection goes astray in making the concept of a problem entirely subjective. People can, after all, have problems of which they're unaware. The problems inspiring technological ventures are often recognized, but they can be more or less objective insofar as the underlying desires would arise with more or less frequency in the particular situation. In the extreme case, when any person placed in those circumstances would develop the wish for change, it's wrong to dismiss the envisaged goal as subjective. It's no idiosyncratic whim, but a natural outgrowth of the situation. Examples from medicine make this clear. To say of someone with a broken leg, of someone suffering debilitating depression, or someone in a crisis from cystic fibrosis, that their problems are purely subjective because they depend on particular desires. They want to walk. They want to experience some vestiges of pleasure. They want to breathe. That's as absurd as it is insensitive. The ethical case is like the medical one. Limited responsiveness once pervaded all aspects of the lives of our human and hominid ancestors. The ethical project is inescapable. We who come late in it live in ways shaped by its achievements and its failures, but we've no option except to continue it in some fashion or another. Equipped with a wider range of emotions and desires, able to envisage many possibilities for human existence and to ponder their worth, the only alternative to ethical life is the condition shared by chimpanzees and bonobos, a predicament surely even more abhorrent to us than it was to the pioneers who took the first steps in escaping from it. The record of human cruelty and indifference, even under the sway of attempts to promulgate patterns for our conduct, undermines any optimistic thought that a few thousand generations of our species have equipped us with some greatly improved capacity for responsiveness. In a world where actions can easily have a profound impact on the lives of many invisible others, in which we're knitted together in a vast web of causal interactions, our lack of responsiveness has an enormously expanded field on which to play. The old disease, our limited ability to perceive and to accommodate one another, can effloresce in extravagant symptoms, social tension and conflict on a global scale. Is that an argument for the normative stance I bluntly adopted earlier when I asserted the continued priority of the original function of ethics? Or is it intended as such? No and no. The genealogy of the ethical project might teach us to be wary of the claims and arguments of individuals, even of the hegemony of argument. For the thought of specific people as entitled to speak the last word on ethical matters was a consequential modification of a previously democratic project. It spun off from an effective strategy for increasing compliance with the code, even when none of your fellows is able to monitor you. Conceiving ethics as the province of individual authoritative experts began in supposing a transcendent standard to which the authorities had special access. Among secular thinkers, it survives in conceiving of a ground of values that can be recognized by processes of individual reflection and reason, available in principle to all, but in practice restricted to an especially wise or astute elite. The professional ethicist replaces the shaman and the priest. My genealogy offers a different model of ethical decisions and revisions, one in which members of a social group attempt to understand the perspectives of the others and share a commitment to finding a resolution with which all can be satisfied. Nothing outside the human world directs the correct answer, but each human perspective is crucial to the negotiation. To adopt this view is to see the history of the ethical project as marked by fundamental distortions 
as those who pretend to authority leave long-lasting marks on ethical practice by inscribing their own predilections and prejudices in enduring precepts in whose name vast numbers of human beings have been dominated or punished. Reasoning and argument have a place in the formulation of a normative stance, as they presumably did in the discussions of the small groups who decided on patterns for living together. But reasoning must be framed by a prior perspective about goals and procedures. I propose a framework motivated by reflection on the history of the ethical project and by the hope that understanding what we have been up to will make progressive change more frequent and more systematic. Because the objective problem of our limited responsiveness to others is pervasive and permanent, it should be at the center of our attention too, inspiring efforts to emulate the obvious strategy achieved when our distant ancestors assembled for discussions on terms of equality in the cool hour. With respect to many issues arising for our continuation of the ethical project, the number of those potentially affected includes millions, even billions, some of them who are not yet born. We can't do exactly as our ancestors did, but reflection on their procedures can suggest an ideal. Modification of ethical practice should flow from discussions among representatives of all points of view, each assigned equal status in the conversation, each freed from identifiable errors and each dedicated to reaching conclusions all can accept. No such ideal can be completely realized, but steps to come closer to it are readily appreciated. Actual ethical discussions would be improved if there were representation of a broader diversity of perspectives, if the participants accepted a ban on appealing to substantive religious doctrines, for otherwise they would fall foul of the requirement to eradicate identifiable errors. And if they were predisposed, either by temperament or by training, to engage at least in a detached setting with the aspirations of others. Conversations of this sort are the best ways of continuing the ethical project. Conjoined with this methodological suggestion is a substantive proposal one committed to the continued centrality of the original problem of responsiveness. The earliest ethical negotiations almost certainly endorsed particular desires for all members of the group, desires for food, shelter, protection, and stability, for example. Focusing on that narrow repertoire of basic needs is inadequate for human beings to whom the ethical project has bequeathed a much more complex collection of emotions and aspirations. The fulfilling life is no longer delivered by supplying adequate food and regular sex, if indeed it ever was. The analogues of those originally endorsed desires are contemporary yearnings to have access to all the preconditions for a worthwhile life. Besides the basic resources required to continue existence from day to day, the preconditions include opportunities to appreciate a range of potential possibilities for human life and to choose freely among them. The tension between maintaining equality and increasing the options for human existence illustrates the phenomenon of functional conflict. Because that conflict runs so deep in the evolution of the ethical project, it must finally be addressed. Through demanding that all people be provided with the preconditions for choosing and pursuing lives of genuine worth, my proposal insists on a redistribution of the material resources collectively owned by our species, a redistribution sufficient to support the material and social bases whose current absence dooms most of the world's people to want and ill health and ignorance and oppression and lack of choice. Among the primary ethical challenges today is the task of reconfiguring our economic and political institutions <coughs> when they currently thwart such redistribution. One worry about egalitarianism is that the economic arrangements it requires undermine the ability to maintain the resources it proposes to divide evenly. The pie shrinks and the equal shares become miserably small. Of course, the size of the shares depends not only on the dimensions of the pie, but also on the number of diners. Egalitarians suppose it to be possible to find a set of economic arrangements 
stably compatible with the envisaged redistribution, provided only that the human population is kept below a bound, a size taken to be at worst in the vicinity of the current total. So we should not want to increase and multiply, at least not indefinitely. So I offer two proposals, one focused on methods of ethical discussion, the other a substantive egalitarian ideal to be entertained in such discussion. Together they constitute a normative stance that fills out the concept of ethical progress and so completes my secular account of values. But why should anyone accept these proposals? What force do these claims have on anybody's conduct? The religious challenger and the philosopher who suspects ethical naturalism will join forces in raising such questions. I'm going to end with some brief answers. Would-be naturalists, people like me, are sometimes saddled with an impossible task. Give us, says the critic, some clearly defined mode of inference that leads from purely factual premises to the action-guiding normative conclusions you offer. If you think about it, that's a bizarre demand. Human beings don't wander around the world gathering facts and nothing but facts until one day they launch themselves into ethical life by some specially adroit means of inference. From our earliest ethical stages as thinking beings, we're immersed in a mixture of factual beliefs and value judgments transmitted to us by our elders. Ethical life is inescapable. The crucial question is how to continue it. Part of the answer is easy. When functional harmony prevails, when it can be shown that a proposed modification of ethical practice better fulfills some functions and interferes with none, that suffices to justify the change. Functional conflict introduces complications. For instances of functional conflict, the critic can finally present his demand. Specify a method of argument that will lead from factual statements, or if you like, from the mix of factual beliefs and value judgments embodied in current ethical practice, to a conclusion about the priority to be given to the conflicting functions. Now, I've evaded that demand. I've retreated to weak talk of proposals, and I've muttered about the hegemony of argument. My proposals, however, don't descend from thin air. They're intended to be received against the background of a particular factual account, a narrative of how the ethical project has evolved to yield the ethical life of the present. Despite the fact that nobody knows how to specify a cogent method of inference leading from premises about the history of a practice to conclusions about how to continue that practice, I want to defend the reasonableness of accepting normative proposals by reflecting on the history of normative practices. Reasonableness in belief is not always reducible to the generation of the pertinent beliefs according to formal rules or precise algorithms. Examples from ethical life reveal changes of attitude in which people come to see themselves and their conduct differently. You learn that words and gestures you didn't intend to hurt have caused pain and humiliation. Episodes of that sort reasonably induce you to reconsider, to adopt a new perspective on what you characteristically say and do, to uproot old habits and to subscribe to new precepts. What occurs is not so much a different selection of statements from within the same vocabulary as a shift of frame. Consider a historical example. Some Victorian readers of Bleak House revised their attitudes towards the justice of then-current treatment of the urban poor. They knew that Dickens had written a novel, not a sociological treatise. They already knew, at least theoretically and probably empirically, that life in parts of London was brutal and squalid. They were moved to feel the awfulness of living in places like Tom All Alone's. Their feelings permeated their hearing of the novel's voices, voices praising the institutions provided for the destitute. Those voices echoed things the readers themselves had previously declared. Unable now to hear such declarations as anything other than hollow, they could no longer pronounce the old judgments with any conviction. Dickens persuaded them reasonably to feel larger sympathies for social reform. Not only fact, but even fiction can do ethical work. 
Argument has to begin somewhere, and chains of inference depend not only on the premises, but on the categories used in formulating them. None of us ever achieves a Cartesian point from which all principles can be scrutinized, all categories probed. Instead, we acquire a frame for our reasoning, picking it up relatively automatically from the contingent culture in which we grow. If we're to amend it or to improve it, that must be as a result of our being led to see things differently. Facts about others, how others see our treatment of them. Facts about the historical evolution of practices we acquire from a long tradition. Even works of fiction and drama. Those are our tools for achieving a change of perspective. So at last, I come to the original challenge. According to the challenger, a religious grounding of values delivers a status no secular alternative can mimic. But how exactly? If the suggestion is that values derive from some divine will, that must confront the objections to substantive religious doctrines that I offered uh, on Tuesday. And it must also address questions Socrates posed long ago to Euthyphro. But there is a purified religious position, less definite, in which the transcendent is identified with the pattern for our conduct. That is seen as the ethical order of the cosmos. But it's only accessible to us in the, in the shifting metaphors of the various religions. Under these circumstances, it seems to me, we have obvious concerns about how we can be guided by a source so little accessible. And if you worry about why you should care about the values generated by continuing the ethical project, I think you should be equally concerned about conforming to an ethical order so dimly characterized and so remotely understood. By contrast, my secular humanism places humanity at the center of value. There's no need for any detour through some dim and remote transcendent, no vindication of human worth in supposing, whether literally or metaphorically, that we're children or servants of God. We are both creators and loci of value, our work of creation prompted by the exigencies of the human predicament. As Dewey says, morality grows out of the very conditions of human life. Out of that work, carried forward in the ethical project, has come nothing less than a transformation of human existence through the forging of connections among people and through the expansion of the possibilities of human lives. As we reflect on that transformation, I think we should regret some of the details, but I think we, should only we can only affirm the project itself, constitutive as it is of who we have become. And that, I suggest, is dignity of values enough. Thank you. The mic is yours. Thanks. We have time for questions, a uh, couple of rules and uh, one bit of announcement. So after the question session breaks off, uh, there'll be a reception uh, out in the hallway uh, to that side, that, to which you're all welcome. Um, with regard to the questions themselves, as you can see, there are two microphones at either side. If you'd like to ask a question, please come forward. Uh, Professor Kitcher will call on you. Uh, do speak into the microphone because the whole session is being recorded, so we'd like to hear you and not just the answer. And please begin by identifying yourself. Thanks. So if you've got a question, come on up. Just do your Billy Graham thing. <laughs> All step forward, please. <laughs> Professor Kitcher, thank you for your presentation. My name is Devin Singh. Um, a comment and a question. It seems that given what we, the little that we do know in our studies of primate groups mm -hmm. um, in terms of the rigid hierarchies and identifications of alpha males, beta males, and whatnot that have been, that have been done, it seems that there may um, be difficulty in attributing a radical egalitarian state to the early human communities. That seems to be still a potentially a mythological um, uh, postulate. So, 
that, that's more of a, of a comment. I'm not sure what right. that does to your to your project. But even if we grant the the existence of those uh, those types of communities, couldn't we also postulate a egalitarian community with a strong transcendent uh, ethical uh, project? And if so, would that be would that be acceptable to you? Um, if a egalitarian community maintained its uh, its status with an appeal to the transcendent, would that be necessarily problematic in the account okay. that you've given? Okay, very good, thank you. Let me say something about the first, uh, your, your comment first. So here I'm following um, uh, three people um, uh, in the anthropological tradition. Uh, and these three people are Richard Lee, who worked on the Kung, um, and Christoph Böhm, who's looked um, in some detail about hierarchy in primate groups and hierarchy in uh, various human groups, hunter-gatherer gr hunter groups, and an article by a guy whose first name I can never remember, but whose, whose last name is Knauft, and who, who draws a lovely curve. Uh, high levels of inegalitarianism in the dif distant past, coming down in through most of hominid history to very low, to very strong egalitarianism, and then increasing in the recent present, sort of U-shaped curve. Now, Berm's thesis, which I think is probably right, is that egalitarianism has to be maintained. He, Berm, uh, sorry, Lee's thesis um, is that you have to, you have, to have uh, substantial social devices for maintaining it. And he's very good on detailing the ways in which the Kung uh, maintain social equality in, the, in their small groups. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I go with that anthropological tradition, and I suggest that since our ancestors lived uh, for, you know, most of their, their ex most of the existence of our species in small hunter-gatherer groups, they'd be rather like the hunter-gatherer groups that people like Boom and Lee have studied. Okay, now to the second part. Okay, now you asked me if I was okay with the idea of a um, an egalitarian group with, um, with, it, with the idea of an external standard rooted in the transcendent. My thought was actually um, just to defend myself by trying to show the possibility of, of managing without the transcendent. So what I wanted to say was that, that you don't need the transcendent to have uh, an objective notion of values. That was my thesis, right? But I do worry about groups that take this detour. The fundamental values don't lie in what we do and the ways in which we come to regard one another and in our negotiations with one another, but they are located elsewhere. That seems to me um, not only an unnecessary detour, but also something that can take the ethical eye off the points at which it really belongs, which are other human beings. So I think in the spirit of humanism, I would really suggest that the version of the ethical project in which it is thoroughly secular is a superior version than the version which has this extra add-on feature that you wanted to give it. Okay, yes. suffer pain. Also the whales, our carbon footprint. Uh, I'd like you to address <coughs> some of these concerns because uh, if, we deplete, if we eliminate nature, I don't know where we're going to be. Okay. That's a very serious challenge for a view like mine. Um, a, uh, a view like mine is committed to seeing um, our obligations to, uh, to other beings as arising from our negotiations. But there is no reason, I think, as we discover more about the psychological and, um, and neural lives of other beings, like elephants, and learn about the, the kinship of their sensitivities to pain with our sensitivities to pain, to have that inform our conversations. 
In thinking about how we are to proceed in our ethical life, if you take my ideal of, of mutual negotiation and discussion seriously, it's very evident that not all people who, who's, who, who are to be affected can be represented, for there are some who are too young, and there are others, um, in members of our species, who lack certain kinds of capacities. So, they, so we have to have representation already of some um, human animals, um, and those they have to be their, their voices have to be represented in the conversation by others. Similarly, I think for non-human animals, and I think we have special obligations in this regard to those uh, animals that we have, in a certain sense, brought into being, those that we have domesticated. I agree with you about the elephants. I agree with you about the dolphins and the whales and all the rest of it. I think mean, there, there's such, there's, once, once one comes face to face with a, an understanding of the ways in which they live, the ways in which they feel, and so forth, that provides a very strong um, reason for thinking about and talking about with one another about how to treat them. But I think we also have. Ob obligations to things like laboratory mice and chickens on farms and so on, because in a certain sense we have created, we have taken over the conditions of their life. Um, so what I envisage is, is a, if you like, an ideal conversation in which the, the features of their lives are taken into account. Now you also talked about carbon footprint, and that, that brings me to something that I really, really do want to talk about. Um, it seems to me that ethics today has to be global. That is, we have to think globally from the beginning. We only have one planet, and our responsiveness to other members of our species, um, if we fail to be insufficiently responsive to the needs of other members of our species, it seems to me highly likely that we will destroy it. Our lives are so complexly interconnected at the moment that it seems to me that there is a profound ethical imperative on us to work together and to broaden the global com uh, conversation in a way that will avoid the disasters that are, you know, the potential legacy that we leave to our grandchildren. So I think that's a very important point to bring up. And this idea of of a pan-human ethics with some extensions to non-human animals um, seems to me to be um, very pertinent at a time when some of the things that we do collectively are endangering the future of the planet, the future of the species, the future of many other species too. Thomas. Hi, I'm a medical student in the form of philosophy major and one reason I which was because I wanted to consider more practical issues. And so this question relates to that. If we look at historically, millions of stories have been passed down, <coughs> real life stories, fictional stories, but the ones that we do remember are the fairy tales and the religious stories because they are extraordinary, because they're impressionable on us. So my worry with secular humanism even though one day everyone, let's say, believes in secular humanism, but the next day they might forget it. Because, or over generations they might forget it, because it's just not as, real life is not as impressionable on us. So, you know, how, how do you strike it into people, and how do you make them want to act on it? Okay, I'm a cosmopolitan about this. Now, this gentleman asked me about a version of humanism that would add on um, an external standard while preserving the egalitarianism. And I said, um, j'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse-là to echo uh, Laplace, right? I don't have any need of that hypothesis, and I don't even want it. Um, so, um, but I'm going to be more conciliatory to you. I think stories that can get people involved in the right kind of ethical conversation are terrific wherever they come from. Um, 
I don't actually agree with you that the, that the, re, the truly effective stories are confined to the religious ones and the fairy stories uh, that we, or the, 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 the nursery tales we learn in childhood. I think those are important. I think some of them are very moving. I think as long as we are, we are conscious of them as stories and metaphors, this is very much in line with what I said on Tuesday, that we can use them for all they're worth. But I also want to make a case for Dickens and Shakespeare and Sophocles and um, lots of other stuff too. And let it all come and let each of us choose which of these metaphors we find most valuable in continuing our own ethical lives and in focusing our own ethical values. Constantly trying these things out in conjunction with others, since my model of ethical decision making is very much a social one. So I'm in favor of this. The important thing is not to give those stories a literal interpretation, then to, um, to regard them as uh, somehow the last word on certain, for certain kinds of ethical matters. But if they are seen as valuable metaphors, always integrated in the service of the, of the ethical discussion, which is for me the core, then I welcome. So, uh, so, my, so secular humanism doesn't say, you know, never read the Bible again. It regards the, the you know, many secular humanists teach courses on the Bible as literature because they regard it as a tremendously important and moving and wonderful document. And I don't, certainly don't want to, uh, I, I mean, I certainly don't want to uh, question that in any way. Hi, I'm Joshua Andresen. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, and I'm, I think I'm very sympathetic to your project, if I understand it correctly. Uh, but I want to express two worries okay. that I have in which um, somebody might uh, utilize it in a certain way, I think, against the okay. way you're presenting it. But it's, if I'm following you correctly, you're presenting a responsiveness as kind of a master value or, or a higher value, and, and that you're explaining in terms of openness and accommodation to others. Um, one worry someone might have is that, well, one would then use that master value, if you will, to look at peoples or cultures and to then grade them on a hierarchy of ethical advancement of this, this group or this culture is more, ethic, is more responsive, more open, more accommodating, thus they're more ethically advanced than some other group. Uh, and so I'm wondering how you might mitigate against that possible worry or if that would be something you'd want to embrace. Uh, okay, secondly, good. I'm wondering, although it seems like you have this responsiveness as a, as a higher value, uh, how you uh, accommodate indignation, how you accommodate uh, closure, how you accommodate uh, you know, putting people in prison or, or possibly even going to war with people. So, so where, where is the limit, in other words, of that responsiveness or that openness or accommodation? How does that fit in your okay. theory? Okay. All right, very good. I mean, the war question is going to be very hard, but, um, but, I, but I think I can say some, some useful things about the others. So first of all, let's, talk, let's think about progress and progressiveness. I don't want to talk about progressiveness um, across cultures. I don't want to say, you know, uh, 21st uh, century uh, America uh, is made, has made a lot of progress on uh, 14th century France, okay? I mean, I think that's, that, that sort of language is really difficult. But I do think that we can look, say, back at our um, hominid ancestors who lived in states of tension and hostility with the groups, the neighboring groups in their area, and couldn't extend whatever ethical practices or proto-ethical practices they had for the governance of their life as a single group to the neighbors. I think we can see it as a real progressive step when they start taking the neighbors into consideration. Right? So I think that, that, that there are some of these comparisons that can be made. Okay, now, responsiveness always has to, has to make um, choices and to be directed. So I said that there are, that it was probably true at the beginning that in these small groups that started the ethical project, they legitimized certain kinds of desires for members of the group. 
the desire to have some food, to have some shelter, to be protected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I suggested that a similar, a kind of, a, 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 an analogous thing for our time is to provide for all human beings the preconditions for a worthwhile life. Okay. Um, now that's quite compatible with recognizing that there would have been in the in those early societies cases in which individuals conflicted and other members of the group had to arrive at judgments about how to sort out those conflicts and, uh, and how to respond, as it were, to a pair of individuals when you couldn't respond completely to both of them. And that remains, of course, with us. We have to, and that's, that's what stands behind a lot of the developed machinery, which has itself come out of the ethical project, about how to assess who is to blame, etc., etc., etc. So this isn't against indignation and against punishment, but it's about continued efforts to work those things out in a framework that tries, as it were, to see things from as many points of view as possible. The limit of that is, of course, when um, when nations go to war, and uh, at the heart of this, at really at the heart of this view as you probably can um, extrapolate already, is the thought that the primary drivers at the moment of um, hostility among large groups of people are, on the one hand, a feeling of being, having been um, uh, shortchanged or humiliated in some way, or subscription to some form of ideology or myth. And that's why I built those conditions that I did into the ideal method for ethical discussion. Terms of complete equality and exposure of identifiable errors. And I think if those, if those the, the more those things can be brought into play in ethical discussion, the, and, and realized in the ac actual relations among people, the more we can do what, what I think is actually the ethically desirable thing, which is not to work out a morality of war, but rather to work out a morality to end war or to make war considerably less frequent than it's been. ...techniques for giving their considered evaluations more power to govern their actions. So, the fully ethical life requires a complex array of psychological dispositions and capacities. Some elements of it are occasionally visible among non-human animals who act in ways that appear praiseworthy. But the only fully ethical beings we know of are human. Many religious people, as well as many philosophers, think that ethical life is answerable to an external standard one independent of human decisions. Those who stop to think about what to do may try their best to find the right continuation, but ethical success isn't guaranteed, not even if their conclusion is thoroughly endorsed by the settled judgment of their society. Religious people often locate this external standard in the transcendent realm. On some philosophical accounts, too, the standard is divorced from the natural world, grounded in a domain of platonic forms or non-natural properties or idealized processes of practical reason. Other philosophers resist this kind of divorce. They hope to explain the standard in natural terms. Sometimes they measure the good by the aggregate of pleasure over pain among all sentient beings. Or, this is a particularly bad proposal, calculate goodness in the fundamental currency of Darwinian evolution reproductive success. Now the first challenge that I'm going to consider to my secular humanism consists in maintaining that any satisfactory account of the ethical life must honor an external standard, call it the ethical order of the cosmos, and that it's impossible to do so without recourse to the transcendent. There are two options for replying. One attempts to dispense with any external standard at all. Ethical delib deliberation answers only to local ethical practice. Now that looks disastrous.
I'm Shelly Kagan. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Yale, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Phil Kitcher, whom uh, we've just been discussing how long it is that uh, uh, we've known each other. Uh, it goes back at least 20 years, uh, and uh, at the time I was considering uh, uh, going to UCSD, where the Kitchers were at the time, uh, and instead I ended up here. It's taken 20 years, but it's of course a great pleasure to, fact, to, to have uh, Kitcher finally here at Yale. Um, in, when Dale Martin introduced him yesterday, he, he rattled through some of the biographies, so I won't do that today. He also mentions uh, one or two of the honors, but I want to just give you a, a somewhat larger picture of that. Among his honors, uh, Professor Kitcher has won a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has won a Distinguished Teaching Award. He has won a Humboldt Prize. He has won a Lionel Trilling Award. And he's won uh, a Friend of Darwin Award. And I assure you this does not come close to uh, all of them. Uh, yesterday it was mentioned that uh, he's got a dozen plus perhaps books uh, and more articles uh, uh, than, than you would believe, so I looked it up. Now, the, the most recent uh, CV I could find was some three years ago, and it had 146 articles uh, on it. Uh, it occurred to me that if I were to actually try to read to you all of his publications, just the titles of all his publications, it would use up the fully allotted 45 uh, minutes uh, or so uh, for the talk. And that would still leave us with some time for, for him to fill us in on all the articles he's published in the last 10 years, <laughs> uh, last, last uh, three years. Um, one other remark is to say just that people who are coming new to Professor Kitcher's work may not have an adequate sense of uh, the remarkable breadth. Uh, this is somebody who, of course, now works on the issues of uh, secular humanism, uh, religion, uh, previous to that. Uh, it gives up any touchstone for assessing the codes of various societies. And as the religious challenger predicted, it seems to lead to Ivan Karamazov and the permissibility of anything. The alternative approach, finding a natural basis for values, suffers from all the objections commentators and critics have lavished on particular suggestions. The would-be identifications fail to pick out the correct classes of actions as good or bad, valuable or worthless. And none can explain the force that ethical judgments have for us. Moreover, if there were some external standard to which innovators were responding at those moments in history when ethical advances seemed to happen, in recognizing the wrongness of slavery, for example, we'd expect whatever natural facts ground value judgments to play some explanatory role in accounting for the change of mind. You can't understand moments of scientific discovery without appreciating the altered relations between discoverers and the aspects of nature they detect. But history seems to offer precious little by way of clue on the natural facts that ethical pioneers detect for the first time. So how should we meet this religious challenge, or more generally, explain the apparent objectivity of ethical life? I think we need a new framework, one that expands the range of options available. I'm going to develop that framework by following a fundamental insight of Darwin's, of whom, as you've just learned, I'm a friend. When we're puzzled about some cluster of phenomena, we can sometimes expand our options by taking a historical perspective and thinking about how the puzzling phenomena have come to be. Full ethical life, as I said at the beginning, requires a complex set of conditions. Tracing their emergence makes it possible to repose questions of ethical objectivity, to escape from a menu of options limited by inadequate concepts. Developing the account will take me a little bit of time, and objections are likely to flood in along the way. I speak from bitter experience here. But I hope that by the time the story is complete, I will have assembled resources for providing answers. So let's begin a long time ago. Human beings evolved from ancestors who had a few of the traits needed for full ethical life. Many primates have genetically encoded neurotransmitters, inclining them to take pleasure in the company of their fellows. Sociality extends deep into the pre-human past. In our more recent history, 
Hominids have spent almost all the time period since our most recent common ancestors with the chimpanzees and bonobos, that's about five million years ago, in social groups of a very particular sort, bands of about 30 to 70 conspecifics, mixed by age and sex. Now, if you think of this room, it's probably about right, except that there are too few very young people. For all its neural attractions, living together isn't easy. Most primates settle for more sporadic social interactions or severely limit the number of mature males in the group or opt for a smaller troop size. Like the chimpanzees and bonobos of today, our hominid ancestors managed a more unusual set of social arrangements. Their achievement rested on a psychological capacity recognizable in our evolutionary cousins, and one inspiring some primatologists to credit them with the building blocks of morality. Chimps and bonobos have the ability to identify the intentions of their fellows, and based on the recognition to adjust their own plans so as to aid the others in reaching the goals they attribute to them. That capacity, I'll call it responsiveness, promotes cooperative projects and accommodations. Evolution, creationism, biology. Uh, he started off in philosophy of mathematics. Indeed, uh, two early articles. One was Fluxions, Limits, and if I understand this, Infinite Littleness. Um, uh, another one was Bolzano's Ideal of Algebraic Analysis. Now, I know that many of you came here in hopes that we would learn more about Bolzano's <laughs> Ideal of Algebraic Analysis, but you'll have to, have to look up the article. Um, but even this doesn't give you a full sense uh, of, uh, of the work. Uh, some three or four years ago, uh, he published a book called An Invitation, to, uh, rather called uh, Joyce's Kaleidoscope, An Invitation to Finnegan's Wake. Uh, I think this just gives you a sense of the full range uh, of interests, and we're getting uh, more of that in, in this lecture series. Um, uh, actually, one or two items of business I should uh, ask you, if you haven't yet done it, please turn off your... Uh, uh, telephone, so we don't have any interruptions. The, the lecture is being recorded. Uh, at the end of today's lecture, there will be time for questions, and I'll give you some instructions uh, with regard to that when the time comes. Uh, meanwhile, let me uh, please just ask you to uh, welcome Professor Kitcher back for a second time. Today's topic is Ethics as a Human Project. Thank you very much, Shelley. Okay, thank you. That's, that was, a, that was a, a lovely introduction. Fully ethical beings are those able to direct their conduct by judgments about what they think of as good or right or virtuous or valuable. Most of the time, they may act from habit, but they sometimes stop, consider what course of action would be best, and act on the basis of their deliberations. They can subordinate some of their wishes, even their most intense impulses, to the value judgments they accept. They can reflect on those value judgments and discuss them with their fellows. They can ponder potential